All right, well, I think we might have our team, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I'm Carl Frank with A&I Financial Services. I'm going to introduce the, the team, let the, the, the gentleman in front of you introduce themselves, and then uh, I'll be our moderator just asking questions, and today's topic is asset protection. Um, here at A&I, we look at asset protection. There's four sleeves of that, financial asset protection, uh, protecting your property, protecting your confidential information, and then protecting yourselves, personal security, and today's a conversation we're going to talk about the first two of those asset protection and property protection uh, next month uh, at a and i we've got a, uh, a gentleman from the fbi going to come talk to us about protecting your confidential information and on our website we have a great presentation from bart combs uh, about personal protection that we did last year and, and we hope to get Bart or somebody like that again this year so uh, without further ado again carl frank a and i financial we work with a small number of successful families we hope you grow and protect your investments and choose how you want to be taxed. Uh, to my left is Nate Merrill. Nate, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Nathan Merrill. I am an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill, and uh, I primarily focus in the area of tax efficiency planning, both for individuals, families, and uh, businesses. And um, a lot of what we do involves the topic today of uh, structuring assets to protect them uh, well into the future. Great. My name is Jeff Kromendike. I'm one of the um, founding partners at uh, Security First Insurance Agency located right here in Littleton. Um, I'm uh, honored to be a part of the expert uh, network team that you see in front of you here, specifically around um, managing and uh, transferring uh, risk for homeowners or households as well as small businesses. Uh, we do that uh, through the process of building long-term mutually beneficial relationships and also managing risk effectively. So um, thanks for joining us and I'm Glad to be here today as well. Mike? Uh, Mike Miller, uh, last but not least. I uh, own and operate Miller Associates CPAs. Um, we provide tax preparation service, uh, IRS representation, accounting and, and bookkeeping services, um, along with working uh, with Nate quite a bit on entity structuring um, and tax planning for our clients. Um, work with all these gentlemen and uh, it's a privilege to be here. Great job. One other thing real quick, I think it would be worthwhile to plug our podcast. Right. So please do check out our Expert Network Team podcast. You can download it anywhere that podcasts are available, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on the internet at expertnetworkteam.com. Thanks, bud. You're welcome. Appreciate it. It's a great podcast. And we talked about taxes, and it wasn't boring. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Of course, I always find tax discussions fun. So well, there's a lot of opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> He's unique. <laughs> you're so I didn't that. say that. Oh, okay. I said you're a geek. <laughs> I like his interpretation of that. Are unique? I heard unique. It's the optimist in me. Well, Jeff, we'll just start with you then. Um, so, Jeff, uh, you you are our insurance expert, and and can you talk a little bit about um, some of the ways we can protect our assets, and, and you know how much insurance is enough? What what are, what are some of the challenges that? that people are facing today and, and what should we be uh, careful to make sure we insure for? Yeah, thanks Carl. Happy to kick us off here. Um, start kind of on uh, kind of the lighter end of things as, uh, as we get into our hour together. But um, uh, one thing I hopefully you all can uh, uh, notice is that we have a lot of fun here, don't we? I mean, it's good hanging out. We do this about once a week, put yep. some podcasts down and uh, we have a lot of fun working together. So I'm, I'm happy uh, that I'm, I'm a part of this. Um, yeah, great question, uh, Carl. And I think, um, you know, really when it comes to, um, you know, really protecting uh, both property and assets, which is in essence what we're talking about today, um, insurance is, does, does play a, a large part in that, certainly. And uh, there's, there's certainly two aspects of it with regards to protecting the assets that you have uh, from any uh, type of um, named insured peril. Um, uh, from a property perspective. So we want to make sure that all assets are protected adequately um, and insured to value with regards to hard assets. Um, those are uh, things like uh, properties, homes, rental homes, any um, income type assets uh, that um, can be insured such as obviously businesses, business personal property, buildings, um, property that's uh, on the move. Um, we think about that oftentimes with regards to um, business businesses that uh, have uh, property that's on the move on a regular basis through an inland marine form. Uh, we talk about insuring vehicles, insuring um, private personal property and possessions, 
um, ranging from fine arts to jewelry to you know just a, a wide variety of anything that's tangible is something that is clearly an asset of yours and therefore should be protected in some way, shape, or form. Um, vehicles uh, as well, but um, in addition to that, any vacation homes, um, rental properties, and, and, and the such. Um, the other aspect of what we really um, uh, focus on, Carl, and, and probably even sometimes more importantly, not that your personal assets aren't important to protect, but I think there's a larger exposure with regards to your um, personal liability or business liability. And um, that's really where we spend a good majority of our time evaluating questions just like you asked. How much coverage is enough? Because in this particular case, we aren't limited by um, ensuring um, what uh, your property is worth, per, per, you know, uh, respectively. So we can't insure your home for twice the value of what it's valued at. Um, but when it comes to liability, and any exposure you have as it relates to um, any risk that you're presenting to the public, whether it be bodily injury or property damage, uh, those are numbers that we can um, really take into consideration and actually um, uh, use some, you know, some real in-depth thought processes as to how much liability insurance is enough um, based on you know, your exposure, the kind of uh, risk that you're presenting to the public as well as, um, in essence, your net worth. And so we really uh, take a, a pretty in-depth look at, uh, first of all, what kind of risk are we presenting to the public or is the client presenting to the public? If we have somebody that has an extensive and lengthy driving record, we know that that person's gonna be more at risk to a large lawsuit than somebody who's never had a ticket before in their lives. Um, do you have a zip line in your backyard? Do you have a swimming pool? Um, do you, uh, you know, drive fast cars? Uh, you know, these are these are exposures that uh, certainly would lead us to the conclusion that we need to consider maybe some higher liability limits. The other aspect of that is, well, what are you worth? Um, what do you have to lose? And so that's really where we work together with um, Carl and and certainly um, the clients to really uh, determine how much liability coverage would be um, uh, prudent for. Uh, not only the risk presented, but also um, the assets to protect. Well said, great job. So along the lines of insurance, I mean, in Colorado, is there anything unique that we should be looking for? I mean, particularly hail damage and other things like that. And, and what about business owners? Should they be looking at some particular things in Colorado too? Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, we are in a, a pretty interesting season in the insurance industry here, uh, not only in Colorado, but uh, nationwide. I think. Um, uh, from a nationwide or a national perspective, of course, of course, insurance is a is a pooling product, right? I mean, it doesn't work if uh, we're just trying to figure out uh, how much premium to charge Nate Merrill based on the exposure that Nate Merrill brings. We have to actually pool um, insurance premiums. So um, a lot of what happens out east, a lot of what happens out west, does impact us here, and vice versa. And Colorado has been definitely contributing to its fair share of, of losses, uh, to say the least. But there's a national um, situation going on right now, specifically around uh, commercial auto insurance, as well as personal auto insurance. Um, there are a lot of things that the insurance industry does, does not know what to do with, um, specifically around distracted driving, uh, as well as um, even uh, the technology that's going into vehicles that are, you know, being almost driven by themselves at this point in time. Um, and not to mention the technology that's being uh, embedded into every panel of the vehicle. And so vehicles are more expensive to replace today than they ever have been. Um, we still have a di major, major distracted driving issue um, that uh, we just don't know how to how to curtail. And so auto premiums at this point in time, if you haven't already noticed in your own insurance portfolio, um, are somewhat out of control and will continue to be for a while. Um, with that said, on the property side, um, hail started flying in a, at a, a very furious rate here about uh, nine years ago and has not stopped. We had a, a little bit of a reprieve here in Colorado last summer. Um, but uh, there's really not a day that goes by uh, in between uh, pretty much uh, April 1st and, in essence, October 1st that hail doesn't fly somewhere in this state every day. Um, we are uh, 
now just moved into the number two spot um, of all states that have uh, major hail exposure. And so um, we have definitely been contributing to a, a, a nation, national um, crisis with regards to storm damage and things like that. So your homeowner's insurance, your business insurance uh, from a property perspective will continue to itch up, unfortunately. But um, it's something we, um, we're, we're working hard on uh, as an insurance agency to bring several options to our clients so that you don't feel pigeonholed into one carrier. And um, we, uh, we continue to, to have access to as many carriers as we can so that we're bringing the best value um, at all times. For things like hail damage, are there some zip, I mean, are there zip codes that are better than others or how do they determine your specific risk of hail or is it just Colorado? At large. Yeah, nothing really uh, west of um, I or I would say C four seventy or anything in the foothills or or mountains um, is being surcharged uh, at, at all at this point in time. Although we have had some storms in the last couple of years uh, up in the conifer area, uh, evergreen even that um, were, were just unheard of before. And so Mother Nature's doing something different than we've ever seen her do before. We don't want to say that you can't be hailed on in, in the mountains. You certainly can be, but um, for the most part, it's the front range of Colorado. Not even the Western Slope really is in, in incurring much uh, hail, and nor does it historically, but um, the, it's, it's primarily the Eastern Slope. I don't know if you took a look over the foothills and you came in, but it's getting pretty darn dark. Yeah, it is. I, I, I have not looked at yeah. the, the radar, but yeah, I'm, you know, it's just a matter of time. And we replaced hail yes. last year with fire. Yes, fire so, too. That's another are. thing. I probably forgot to mention that. We're still uncertain what uh, last year's fire season is going to do to property rates, but uh, just because you're not in the mountains doesn't mean you won't help uh, pay for the losses that occurred up there last year. And thank you. Very insightful. So we're number two. We got to try harder. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And we trade, well, uh, Texas and Oklahoma trade spots every every once in a while. So we're kind of maybe two or three, depending on where. It might not be. Texas the one has a geographic way. advantage. So just yeah, they do. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Right. Great stuff. Well, thank you. Well, pipe in. Uh, let's change the topic and start with Mike and Nate. And, uh, and you want your PowerPoint? Let me pull it up. I can pull it up. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So share the PowerPoint. Nate is an overachiever and put together <laughs> things to make the rest of us look Thanks, bad. Thanks, Nate. But we love him anyway. So. I just thought it would be helpful. So what I'm going to go over here is, you know, I, I'll go back to Jeff here real quick. Insurance is always the easiest, easiest way to cover your monetary risk and, and that mean or your monetary exposure. Like if you're going to have exposure, you want to have someone else pay it. And, and that's certainly where insurance comes in. What I'm going to talk about is how we mitigate or potentially limit some of that financial exposure. So what I've got up on the screen is the saying, you know, from Poor Richard's Almanac, Almanac, a penny saved is a penny earned, and I'm going to swap into that protected in place of saved. So, penny protected is a penny earned. So, the more that we can protect from exposure to even insurance coverages, our rates go down. You know, all that other stuff factors in. So, it always makes sense to institute some level of liability shields which is what I'm going to be talking about. And I just felt that the, the PowerPoint would be more helpful to, to see some of this rather than hear me just talk about it. So, um, it. thank you. The common questions are, how do I protect my personal property from my rental property? Meaning you have rental property that you're leasing to third parties and you have your stuff. You want to create some barrier between the people who rent your property from getting hurt and going after your stuff. So we'll talk about that. Um, does a revocable trust provide asset protection? And I'll just answer that because I don't actually have a slide on that. The general response there is no. Revocable trusts are more estate planning vehicles than anything. They do not provide asset protection for the grantor, the person who creates it. And then last, how does using an LLC protect me or my property from creditors? And that's where we're going to spend a lot of time. Um, so I'm going to flip through some of these wordy slides. You can read them. Uh, but in general, the, the types of things we're protecting against are third-party liabilities, creditor liabilities. Um, if, if you're in an occupation where there's a lot of professional liability, a doctor or other type of professional, you, you might have personal liability where you want to 
um, segment that out where it's beyond what you might be able to get in terms of malpractice coverage. And then if you just have substantial surplus assets that you don't need for you know your lifestyle maintenance, these are the things we're, we're talking about protecting and, and mitigating the exposure. So the, the types of vehicles we use are limited liability companies, limited partnerships, You've also heard of them as LLCs and LPs and then corporations or inks. Um, and then trusts, and there's different types of trusts. I've already indicated that revocable trusts are not asset protection vehicles, but third party settled trusts, i.e. someone else creates the trust for your benefit. Those can have liability protection pieces to it. Um, and then at the extreme, there's the offshore stuff, which I, I really won't address today. But the important thing to think, and, and I'll, I'll you know, certainly elicit input from Mike and Jeff on this, is at every stage, the, the legal structuring is never a replacement for the other things that Jeff already talked about. And then with any kind of legal structuring, there are at some level accounting and uh, tax reporting implications. So we'll try to do that in real time and bring in your so, so a quick question on the, on the trust piece. The revocable isn't uh, an asset protection vehicle, but is an irrevocable trust? It is, and we'll talk to okay. the irrevocable trust. Those are the third-party settled trusts. Generally speaking, a self-settled irrevocable trust doesn't qualify for much asset protection unless you are forming it and complying with an asset protection statute. And there's a number of states that have domestic asset protection statutes where if you do certain things, you're in the clear as far as domestic claims or presumably domestic claims being made against those trusts. Another important disclaimer with this slide is that this is, you know, this presentation is information purposes only. I'm not providing legal advice to any individual situation and, and cannot be relied on as legal advice. And that's because every situation is different. There's no single way to secure asset protection. Um, some of these are very basic slides. You'll, you'll see the, the applicability, but um, but that's important to remember as well. So here's a basic example of how um, an LLC provides asset protection. You own a rental property. This is the easiest way to describe it. And rather than own that rental property as yourself, you, you put it into an LLC, a limited liability company. And you may be the single owner of that entity, but by virtue of putting it in, you've now created this blue liability barrier and the important thing is to understand in this context the limitations of that. If you have a tenant, they slip and fall, it's your fault for not maintaining the property you know, appropriately, your insurance will kick in at that point to help pay for it. But say the claims are in excess of your insurance limits, they wanna get a judgment that goes beyond that and come after you. With this uh, structure in place, the most they could do is secure a lien against the property. Again, that's not great but all your other stuff is protected. Everything above that blue line, um, assuming you've you know, kept in, intact the appropriate corporate formalities, which includes you know, keeping separate books and records and that sort of thing. Um, so, so color commentary on my side is, when I talk to my clients, I, 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 just like you just did, I specify, hey, I'm not an attorney, I can't give legal advice, but correct me if I'm wrong and add, add your color on this, but um, the first thing is, is, if you ever litigate it, the first thing they want to know is what's your entity structure? Right. right? Are you a sole proprietor? Are you an LLC? What S Corp? What are you? Right. And, and then they look at it and they say, all right, do you have, um, are you current with the Secretary of State? Right. You have to pay that $10 fee every year to keep your, your, your structure um, legit in, in covering your asset. Third one is, do you have an operating agreement? And, and the biggie there is, I have so many clients that come in and go, what's that? Yeah. And they have no idea that they even need it, right? So that ties you as the owner to the LLC and, and, and gives you certain rights within that LLC. Yeah, absolutely, and, and it's more perfunctory or formality than anything, especially at the single member level. You're having an agreement with yourself. Right. Um, but it is a formality that is indicative of the fact, and this is why the separate books and records or financials are so important, is that you're not paying for your haircut out of it. You're not paying your personal mortgage payment. You're not commingling these assets. That's the next, that's the next two bullet point items. Yeah. Is one is, is, do you have a separate business account for the LLC? And are you commingling business with personal accounts? With, with so, so just having an LLC, yeah. very good point is just having an LLC and dropping the title into the LLC 
does not alone solve your problem. There are additional steps. It is more formal, and but with that formality, you've now just protected everything up above that blue line. So when 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 you are litigated and you have all those five things, you know, kind of covered. I mean, the attorneys are trying to pierce that corporate veil mm -hmm. to get at your personal the blue assets. line. Yeah. yeah. The thin and blue line. The thin blue line. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just say on the uh, coattails of that, Mike, it's very important that that insurance contract that you see on the left side of the page there is written in the name of the LLC, not in in your name or even has your name on it personally. So um, that all kind of keeps that uh, corporate veil um, clean and, and un, unpenetrated. Uh, one other brief commentary I'll make on this is oftentimes these properties are financed and there's some issues that come into play there in terms of moving a property that you purchased and financed in your own name into an LLC. But keeping in mind that even if we do drop that into an LLC and you're on the note or you're on the, you know, the, the mortgage, um, you can't avoid that financial liability. That's something that still is an exposure. Only way to get around that is to actually have the property be the the financing entity and have it somehow be not recourse debt. So the other thing too is when you actually move that title into the LLC, if if banks are paying attention, which ninety nine percent of them aren't, they can call the note due. Yeah. If they see we can always fix title. that too. So you can always get we can play a game of you can play a game. default. Yep. But yep. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on to uh, this is a so often overlooked issue with single member LLCs, particularly in Colorado. Some states you don't have this problem, but it's the outside liability in. So we talked about how when you have the property in the LLC, you're protected from liabilities through the property up to you. However, if you are a single owner of a limited liability company in Colorado and you're in a traffic accident, you still have insurance, so insurance is gonna pay it, but say you caused a 30 car pile up, you've maxed out your limits, everybody's suing you, and all your stuff is in this LLC. All you got left is in the LLC, and you wanna claim that they can't get at it because it's in a company, it's not your stuff. Well, in Colorado, they can get judgments that will force you to liquidate a single member or a single owner uh, li limited liability company so that they can get at that property. They can force a liquidation if there's no other owners involved, if there's no other uh, diversity of interest. Um, so that's an important thing to remember. One thing also I'll point out about the single member LLC to, to also refer to Mike is as a single member LLC, if you're not doing anything different, you are a disregarded entity for tax purposes. So that means everything flows through to the schedule. Schedule C. Schedule C, or yeah. if it's a rental property, it's Schedule E. Schedule yeah. E. Yeah. So you'll still look like a an entityless tax return, even though you may have multiple single member LLCs. By the way, Carl, are we recording this? We are. Okay, good. Yeah, we'll put I'm this learning on the some web. things. Yeah. Yeah. I wanna, you want to refresh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So what I a quiz for you afterwards. Okay. What I have um, shown on this slide is a different type of external creditor. You have a bank that is coming after you for a loan in default. Same principles exist. If if you've taken out too much credit and you have assets in an LLC that you are the sole owner of they can come after those assets. So not a whole lot adding on that slide, just showing how it applies in different contexts. So here is a partial fix to that problem, which is have an entity that's owned by two people. From a tax perspective, the first thing that comes into play here is the minute you introduce a new owner into that holding co, as I've got it labeled here, it becomes a tax partnership. Okay, it comes to 1065 form, correct? So I, I don't know if you want to speak to that just real quickly a little bit, what that means to become a, a, a partnership as opposed to disregarded entity. Uh, well, one, it takes you off of either Schedule E or Schedule C, puts you onto a 1065 return, which by definition, you're still an LLC. You're still a limited liability company for legal purposes, but for tax filing purposes, you're now a multi-member LLC, which defaults you to the partnership. Um, partnership, in similarity to Schedule C for your business, um, you're still subject to the self-employment tax. If you're Schedule E, it flows through to your personal return still as Schedule C income, which is passive. So if that's an active trader business, it would be self-employment tax. If it's rental properties, it doesn't convert, correct? Just correct. Okay. So um, the other point there is that what they'll get is a K-1. They'll get a K-1. And that K-1 is what they'll use to plug in the numbers right. on their 1040. 
So the liability protection aspects of the slide. So I've, I've illustrated a few things here is you have a holding company because again, if we have a single LLC and we start acquiring multiple properties in a single LLC, now all those multiple properties are sharing liabilities with each other. So anytime, especially in Colorado, I show an alternate structure here, sometimes out, outside of Colorado, you use a different type of structure, but entities are so easy to form in Colorado that we, we drop each property under its own limited liability company. Each one of those those property SPEs, as I call them, are um, disregarded entities as to the holding company. So there's not four different tax returns there. There's right, just the just one, one holding company tax return. And, um, and so we essentially have two different liability protections there. We have the, the bottom blue line, which protects the liability from property to property, as well as upstream to the holding company. And then the holding company, because it's now a partnership under Colorado law, as long as that second owner has more than just what we call de minimis ownership, that now protects the forced liquidation. All that outside creditor can do now is get a judgment against, it's called a charging order. They can't even foreclose the interest in a limited liability company, I meaning they can't take the ownership from you. They just get like a garnishment essentially against that ownership so that any distributions that come out, they can grab them when and if they come out. So it really chills collection efforts. It creates a, a fairly solid um, chilling of, of some of those recovery efforts that might ensue as a result of the liability from the outside in. Again, we still have the slip and fall protection. The only property exposed there is the one that has the slip and fall on it. And I don't have the insurance up here, but you know the holding company really doesn't do anything. It's just a holding company, but you might name that as an additional insured as well, would you know? Yeah, good question. And, and my question is, is back to you here, Nate. Um, in the insurance industry, when we have several different entities like this that are commonly owned at least 51% or more, we can actually insure all three of these properties on one policy. Oh, um, what would be your recommendation there? I mean, does that, does that feel like it uh, is commingling some assets that we maybe shouldn't? As long as you're sharing the cost of that policy, pro rata or, you know, I don't know if the, those can be premiums. We can break them out. Break sure. them out. That would be the ideal way is that they're properly accounted for among the properties. So looking at this again, <clears throat> books and records, you're looking at each LLC holding its own set of financial statements, its own bank account. Right. Everything consolidates up into the holding company for reporting purposes on the 1065. Yeah. So yeah, as, as, as we start to branch out here, things become a little bit more complicated, but again, we're trying to preserve and protect what people have accumulated or what they're building. So, so here I introduce the third layer of asset protection. This is tiered LLCs with multiple owners, including what I'll call a spousal trust, which I'm using the spouse as the third party settler in this case. Um, husband and wife, the wife makes a gift of her interest into a trust, so she owns, call it 50%, or 1%, but I have her, I have her contributing the other 99%. So before this, or 98%, so before this, she owned 99, husband owned 1%, she throws 98% into a trust for the benefit of the husband, makes him the trustee of that trust, that does, even in Colorado, afford you a fair amount of liability protection as to the husband. The, the, the creditors going after the husband cannot get at those assets in the trust. A wife's creditor might be able to go after those assets to some extent, um, but uh, the husband's cannot, and then we still have the same blue lines down below. Nothing's really changed down there. The one thing I'll point out here, again, from a Mike perspective, is those trusts typically are set up as what we call grantor trusts. Sure. So even though the wife has given away 98% of her ownership in the company, we're not filing a separate tax return for that trust. It may even have its own tax ID number, but how do you, how do you address that where it has its own tax ID number, it has its own bank accounts, it's getting its own K-1. If it's generating income, it's a grantor trust, it's really a transparent entity, the information just flows back onto the personal yeah. return as if there were no trust. Right. So uh, that, that's the liability shield that we use when people are, you know, I'll use the doctors as an, ex as an example, is where a doctor has a concern that he's gonna have a patient liability, a, you know, medical malpractice, and they wanna take some of their surplus assets that they don't use to live on, 
they stick them in this trust and they and, and the husband the doctor in this case um, could be reversed so I, I don't mean to be you know exclusive in any way as the trustee of that trust can still manage and deal with those assets however they feel like it so as money flows up from the holding company into the trust they can go out and buy additional properties or you know make additional investments through that trust it doesn't really impair the ability to access those assets for purposes of continued growth um, and even to some extent lifestyle maintenance we, we from an estate tax perspective try to look at these assets as last ditch you know rainy day type stuff because we're really protecting it from both tax and and creditors i thought the doctor is a really interesting example because much of what you've talked about so far has been for example real estate owners uh, and a doctor might not be but could have significant liability and benefit from asset protection strategies correct right that's that's absolutely right and, and this is a, a variation just introducing the straight up asset protection trusts you know you used to you know not gosh like probably 10 15 years ago the only way to get into a quote-unquote asset protection trust was to go offshore which was great for attorneys who had to travel to the Caymans or the Cook <laughs> Islands and set these things up but unfortunately now it's you know places like South Dakota and Delaware and Utah and <laughs> Las Vegas so maybe Las Vegas is the sexiest asset protection jurisdiction that we presently have but um, the ones I use more fr frequently now than before are the Utah ones and, and just as an example the way the Utah works you can as an individual take your stuff put it into a trust you have to have an what they call an independent trustee regarding distribution so again we're looking at putting this stuff more or less out of reach for day-to-day -day living this is not a way to protect the stuff you need to maintain your lifestyle it's a way to protect everything else but you take that stuff and you, you put it in the trust and you, you publish notice that you or, and give notice to known creditors that you've done this and they have six months to make any active claims. If they don't have an active claim, there's nothing for them to do. At the close of six months, all claims are barred as to those assets, um, as long as you haven't committed fraud and you know those sorts of things. So um, that one has a little more procedural you know elements to it but i think it makes it stronger as a as a strategy than the ones that don't require any notice to creditors one of the reasons i think a lot of people like um nevada is it's a one-year statute of limitations right. but in utah if you give notice it's six months so if you have the concern that there's an impending potential liability that could be outside of six months it's a great way to get ahead of that um, and you don't have to be a Utah resident, you just have to be a Utah trust for that, which means your trustee, your independent trustee would have to be a Utah trustee, but banks and, and other entities can serve that function. So that's essentially how an asset protection trust works, and it can be self-settled. If it's not self-settled, I usually don't go the asset protection trust route unless there's a real potential for a known liability and you want the extra protection, but third-party settled trusts, you usually can just go straight up without using the asset protection trust um, vehicle um, and this is the the variation on the single member LLC underneath for the properties is and there's the you know the rich the, the rich dad poor dad Robert Kiyosaki no trademark infringement intended um, he promotes this type of structure a lot through his seminars which is to use what's called the land trust it's just a basically a grantor trust that is um, designed to give uh, liability protection from the property upstream um, because the trust is the owner of the property but it's a it's effectively a grantor trust for tax purposes and you can own the properties in these land trusts and they don't require as much uh, they don't require state filings to, to maintain them they just exist as long as the trust is in existence so that's just an example of a variation on the tiered structure using trusts and in these days now when you look at the land trusts um, I, know, I remember them about 10 years ago and the issue was more along the lines of privacy still existing today yeah I mean that's that's one of the reasons why they're also beneficial because there is no state filing you, you can name your land trust the uh, the Vulcan land trust you know if you're if you're a Star Trek fan and nobody's gonna know who owns it, who can sign for it, outside of specific so, transactional revelation. So if there's litigation, it's very difficult for an attorney to find these To assets. find out where you have where assets. You have, yeah. 
That's another why people use a lot of times they use Wyoming LLCs, similar identity protection structures with more express liability shield. So it, that's what I say at the beginning, every situation is gonna vary a little bit. But those are also kind of tax nothings, disregarded entities. So here I've shown um, just one variation on kind of the, the tiered LLC with multiple owners is also employing the use of a management company. And this is often the case where you have multiple owners of the property, maybe different people investing to purchase the property, but you have maybe one or more of those or somebody's kid that's actually managing the properties and setting up a separate entity for that person to draw their management fee, act as the landlord, kind of creates an, another barrier between the actual property itself and, and operating each property separately versus consolidating that management through a company. You probably do this if you had more than three, but if you're getting upwards of like five, 10 investment properties, using a management company to consolidate all those leases and collections and everything through one company, so you're making sure everything goes into the right account. With the management company, it's just all going into the management company. Accounting and 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 accounting, that, accounting goes crazy with that one. Yeah, <laughs> but it does simplify making sure the right checks are yep. going to the right accounts and that sort of thing. Um, and that's essentially like hiring a property manager that you create, and uh, probably some additional liability protection there. Um, but generally speaking, the management company being the agent of the specific properties can't can't delegate all its legal responsibility to the management company but they'd probably you know a litigant would probably first look to the management company for having not properly managed and maybe then try to go after the property um, and just a real quick overview of how split interest trusts work um, and, and the, the reason why I've included this one is a lot of time people will ask about how do I protect my personal residence outside of insurance outside of an umbrella policy um, one way to do it is to create an asset that nobody wants to go after, and that's that's what we're doing here. Is we're a split interest trust is where you're basically taking the asset, putting it into a trust, a grantor trust. So normally it wouldn't give us any asset protection, but we're splitting up that interest. So I'm retaining as the grantor a, a use of the property for 20 years, and then the trust gives to the beneficiaries the balance of that interest. So all I have as an individual anymore, it's an irrevocable trust, but all I have as an individual is use of the property for 20 years. So if someone wanted to come after me and try to take my house, all they could really take is the 20 year interest or the balance of that 20 year interest. After that, the trust owns it and gives it to the children. So it is a way again to, to bifurcate a little bit of that ownership, create kind of like we did with the partnership, creating a two ownership structure. We've created a two interest structure here where we've retained what, what the market would consider a very useless interest because it's not like even if they foreclosed your 20 year interest, but the last time I checked, I've never seen any listings for 20 year interest in a personal residence. They, they, they don't, not sure what the values that no, it's be, they're yeah. not, they don't really exist. Pretty so, minimal. do they assume the expenses on that property as well? Generally speaking, those trusts are set up so that while the life tenant or the, the, the term tenant is, they require, they, they cover the maintenance costs and any capital expenditures will be covered by the trust. So roof replacement and structural problems are trust expenses, but your utilities and ongoing general maintenance are, are uh, the life or the term tenant's responsibility. So staying on, staying on the, the real estate rental piece of this, um, what do you say to, to, to real estate holders who say, I just I just buy a big insurance policy. I don't I don't put them in LLCs or structuring. I just I just hold them in my name and I just get I just get insurance policies for them. Yeah, the, the that works as long as you don't have a liability that exceeds policy limits. Because if the liability and I'll use a, a, a tragic example that happened here in Colorado a few years back, someone owned a property up in the mountains, family was renting there, and I think they actually got it through a prize and there was a carbon monoxide leak, the whole family died, you know, parents and four children or something like that. That more likely not is gonna exceed any policy limits you have on, on even a rental property coverage. So now the person who owned that property, if they didn't own it through an LLC, has potential exposure to all that. So it's all about policy limits and what your real exposure is. 
I've also talked to people who have had rental properties that uh, became condemned because of methamphetamine contamination and you know sometimes we're talking about liabilities that far exceed what ultimately the property value might be sure. so if you have a property that you own directly becomes a meth lab and you're now responsible for the cleanup um, that that's gonna that property just went to zero right. <laughs> and now you're responsible for paying all the expenses of the cleanup Hard Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate you. I, I am a client of all of your firms, and I know we benefit from you protecting our um, assets, and, and our clients benefit indirectly from that. So anybody here who'd like to take it, uh, get some free advice, uh, please reach out to any one of us, uh, and we will put this on the web. Share this with your friends. Check out the Expert Network Team podcast. You can download it at Apple, Spotify, or just at expertnetworkteam.com. Next month, we're going to talk about cybersecurity and protecting yourself online. And soon, we'll bring back Bart Combs or another person to talk about personal protection. We thought he was great. And maybe this time, he'll throw Mike over his shoulder. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> A little demonstration. <laughs> All right, everybody. That'll be interesting. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat>